The biggest surah of the Qur'an is Surah Al-Baqarah and it's placed right after Surah Al-Fatiha for a very particular reason. There are many things said about Surah Al-Baqarah and one of them for example is لِكُلِّ شَيْءٍ سَنَامٌ وَسَنَامُ الْقُرْآنِ Al-Baqarah Everything has a climax, everything has a peak and the peak of the Qur'an is Baqarah. This is the largest surah of the Qur'an and it contains virtually every other subject that is going to come in the Qur'an is essentially explaining something that Allah has already elaborated in Surah Al-Baqarah in that sense. But it's the most in one way you can think about it, it's the most comprehensive summary of all of Islam in one place, that's Surah Al-Baqarah. So in it there are many ideas, but one of them that we're going to focus on, which becomes a subject throughout the Qur'an, is that we are the children of Ibrahim alayhi salam. And of course, Ibrahim alayhi salam further back in the progression of the story is the child of Adam alayhi salam. Of all the creation, Allah Azza wa Jal chose Adam alayhi salam. And of all the children of Adam alayhi salam, Allah especially chose to be his friend, Ibrahim alayhi salam. And of all the other prophets, Allah chose Ibrahim alayhi salam for his children to be prophets and to carry on the legacies of prophets. And so the two lines of Ibrahim alayhi salam through Ishaq and through Ismail, most of the prophets that the Quran is talking about, except for the Arab prophets here and there, like Salih and Shu'ayb, etc. Most of the prophets that the Quran is talking about are from the children of Ibrahim alayhi salam, that lineage from Ishaq, the Israelite prophet. The Yahya and Zakaria and Ya'qub alayhi salam, etc. and others are actually all part of that lineage coming from Ibrahim alayhi salam. But particularly from the children of Ishaq and then Ya'qub, whose other name is Israel, this is all important for a reason. Just like Allah chose Adam alayhi salam as a special creature among all other creatures, just like Adam alayhi salam, uh, just like Allah chose Ibrahim alayhi salam as a special prophet among all other prophets, just like that He chose Bani Israel, the children of Yaqub alayhi salam, as a special group of children, a, a special nation, a tribe by themselves over all other tribes. He gave them a special status, and that status elevated them to the point where Allah azza wa jal gave them. Prophet after prophet after prophet in a narration we find that the Messenger وسلم, even says Every time a prophet would die, another would take his place among the children of Israel. This is the blessing Allah gave them. Allah even describes this concept in the Quran as ala atharihim bi rusulina. We re reinforced their legacy with our messengers. We kept reinforcing their legacy with our messengers, right? So this is something that they were greatly honored with. But the question is why? All of all nations, when the Banu Israel were chosen, they were chosen because when you get selected for something, that means you have a bigger responsibility than everybody else. That's what that means. If I get chosen for a job to be the manager, that means I'm more responsible than all the other employees. That's why my boss chose me. So if this nation was chosen, it's not just because they're, it's not because they're better or they're genetically superior. It's because they are now in a position to carry a greater responsibility and they are capable of carrying that responsibility because Allah never gives anyone a responsibility more than they can handle. La yukallifu Allahu nafsan illa wusaraha. So the same way Allah gave this nation a responsibility and the responsibility was I will give you my word, I will give you my book, I will give you my prophets and you will show all the other nations of the world what does a nation look like when it's under the shade of Allah? When it's in the shade of Allah's book, when it lives by Allah's guidance. It's one thing, prophets live under Allah's guidance. A few of their followers live under Allah's guidance. But what does it look like when an entire nation lives under Allah's guidance? Your responsibility will, not to, will be not just to be an individual model, it will be to be a national model. So other nations will look at you and say, why are they like this? How come they have peace like nobody else? How come they have brotherhood like nobody else? How come they have mercy and family life like nobody else? How come they have more blessings than anybody else? Where did all of that come from? And humanity will flock towards the religion of Ibrahim alayhi salam because Ibrahim alayhi salam, when he was building the Kaaba, he wasn't building it for one nation. His dua was all people will turn towards it. And now his children at a national level, at the level of a nation, were supposed to become that model. Surah Al-Baqarah describes first that they were given that role to be the role model, to demonstrate to the world what it looks like to be under God's shade, to be under the shade of Allah. Then Surah Al-Baqarah describes how they messed up. They were given this amazing responsibility and they fumbled. They basically dropped the ball. And they, 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 they failed in many, many ways. Not one, they had multiple failures. And what Allah does, almost up until ayah number 121 of Surah Al-Baqarah, 
do a careful reading of that yourselves, what Allah is going to do is describe how come Allah chose a nation. When Allah chooses a nation, they are capable of doing the job. How come even though you were capable of doing the job, you failed? And what were your points of failure? What exactly was your failure? One after the other, after the other, after the other. The point of the Quran, the purpose of the Quran, is not to say these people are good and these people are bad. That is not the purpose of the Quran. In fact, the Quran doesn't condemn human beings. The Quran doesn't even condemn Fir'aun. Fir'aun can make tawbah. Even he, Musa alayhi salam, is told you can go to him and maybe he will make, he will remember. So the Quran is not interested in damning a nation or damning a people. But the Quran is interested when it brings somebody to trial, just like on Judgment Day, it's actually, it's not just you're thrown into Jannah or thrown into Jahannam. Here's where you failed. Here's what happened. You see, there's a review of what you and I did. The same way Allah does a historical review of what this nation did. Where did they fail? And, what, and as a result of those failures, what happened? Now, this is an important point of departure. Muslims generally should understand these things. I don't think we talk about them enough, which is why I'm dedicating this khutbah to it, especially given the climate that we find ourselves. In. When Allah sent prophets to different nations and those nations rebelled against Allah, and rebelled against those prophets, like the people of Nuh السلام, or the people of Salih السلام, etc. When the majority of those people disbelieve, then Allah punishes them in this life and the next life. This is a rule of Allah. You will see it consistent in the Quran. So the people of Nuh are flooded in this life and that doesn't save them from the punishment of the next life. They have to suffer here and then they have to suffer there when they disbelieve in Prophet, when they disappoint Allah in that way. The same thing happens with the nation of Salih The same thing happens with the nation of Shu'aib And over and over again, you find You don't find a change in the way Allah deals with people in His ways. Allah has a set rule, He will apply that rule throughout. It's universal. Nobody gets to be an exception. But there's a different set of rules for nations. Not the, those are people who reject prophets. But when Allah chooses not a prophet, when Allah chooses an entire nation, right? Bani Israel is not a, they're not a prophet. They are an entire nation. When Allah chooses a nation and they disappoint Allah and they disobey Allah, Allah does not destroy that nation. Allah does not bring a flood and get, get rid of that. He doesn't do this. What Allah does then is He humiliates that nation in this world. What Allah does is that He makes them powerless. What Allah does then He He punishes one of the punishments that happen to them because they play with the word of Allah is they become each other's enemy. They start fighting each other even though they're all believers. They start calling each other kuffar. They start destroying each other's homes and resources. So they don't even need, they don't even need an enemy from the outside. Their biggest enemy become themselves. This is part of the punishment they suffer because they don't live up to what Allah the responsibility Allah gave them. And Allah demonstrates this in Surah Al-Baqarah. There are many things Allah demonstrates. I'm only going to give you maybe one because times are only a few minutes, perhaps only one, not two. And one of them is the Israelites who were chosen, Allah allowed them to escape Fir'aun. Okay, Allah, Allah, they were living as slaves under Fir'aun and Allah allowed them to escape. They crossed the water, Fir'aun drowned. So now this nation, you know how we say in America, one nation under God, quite literally, they're out in the desert, one nation under the shade provided by Allah. That's what they were now, right? And at that moment, when Allah gave them manna and salwa, some of you know the story, they were being provided for in the desert. Eventually, they got tired of living that way. So they came to Musa alayhi salam, the ayah I read before you. They came to Musa alayhi salam and they said something. They said, could you make dua to your Rabb? I know we get our food and these 12 springs have come out. But could you get some onions? I really miss onions. Garlic was so good, man. When you put that garlic sauce on that shawarma, oh, it's so legit. Can we have some, can you make extra dua for some garlic, some lentils, some lentil soup? It's just so good. You know, the full on Mediterranean diet. Can we just, because we're missing a lot of these ingredients. Now the question is, the real question is, where did they eat onions? And where did they eat garlic? And where did they eat lentils? Where did they eat that stuff? They used to eat that stuff in Egypt. They used to eat that stuff when they were slaves. They used to eat that stuff in that old life, in the life of slavery. In other words, they missed some things from the old days, from the days when they were living under the rule of the kuffar. That's what they missed. And in fact, even in the story of the golden calf, the cow was a major symbol in the Egyptian empire. 
Even the idea of the calf didn't come from them, it actually came from Egyptian traditions and made its way into their religious experience. That's what they did. Now, what is that teaching? And by the way, uh, Abu Sa'ad responded to them and said, but You want to replace something better with something worse? You want to copy those ways? You want to be like that? Again, you want to just assimilate into the old ways again? I see what you're really asking for. Okay, you know what? You deserve another. It literally says Mislan, which means land or region, but it's a play on word. Why don't you deserve another Egypt? It's like Allah is saying, Who's I saying you deserve another Egypt? And then Allah says about this nation, Listen to this carefully. What was the consequence of wanting to be like your oppressors? What was the consequence of, of missing the days when you were living under their rule? What was the consequence of that? Allah says the first thing, they were they were struck, they were slapped with humiliation and powerless. Dhilla is both meaning. Dhul in Arabic means someone who's powerless. And Dhul also means someone who's humiliated. So they were powerless and humiliated. Well, maskana. Maskana is a combination of two words in Arabic. Masaka and sakana, actually. It's a rubai. It combines both meanings. It means when you're stuck in a situation and you cannot get out. You're stuck and you can't get out. So their social situation, they don't have any social mobility. Economically, they can't empower themselves. They're not able to lift themselves and become a, a military power. They are stuck where they are. They can't seem to get out of their mis their rut, their situation. And then the worst of all, the third piece, and they drew upon themselves a special anger coming from Allah. That's what happened to them. That's what happened to them. Now, why am I telling you this about those past things? Allah did not give us this history lesson in the Quran because he wanted to know us to know fun facts about the Israelites. Allah gave us this because Allah is giving us principles by which Allah will judge until judgment day. So Allah has a sunnah of how he deals with nation, nations that disbelieved prophet. Allah has a sunnah for that. Allah also has a sunnah for nations that he chooses. When he chooses a nation, and they don't do what Allah wants them to do, they don't live up to his standard, then Allah will put them through humiliation. And Allah will make them feel powerless. And Allah will bring a rage of him on them. And this is not, this, don't misunderstand. What's happening in Gaza right now, the people that are doing it, the shayateen that are doing it, deserve the worst punishment from Allah. This is not getting anybody off the hook. And this is not a condemnation of our brothers and sisters in Gaza or anywhere else where Muslims are being uh, oppressed. But understand, we are kajasad, we are one body. If one part of my arm was bleeding, it's not my arm's fault, I wasn't careful. I wasn't watching where I was going. And if I'm letting it bleed and not putting a band-aid on it, that's not the arm's fault, that's the entire being's fault. We are, as a whole, responsible. We're as a whole responsible. So at the end of these few minutes that I have with you, what I want to share with you is a lot of times just growing up, I attended my share of khutub and durus, khutbahs, lectures, and things like that. And a lot of lectures, they're supposed to make you feel bad at the end. Like you just feel like, ah, oh, we're so messed up. Yeah, we became just like the Israelites. You know what? Yeah, we, we're just... We're just a bunch of losers. And all the all the good people, all the people that lived up to the, the word of Allah, all the people that Allah was happy with, they were so great, but unfortunately they're all dead. And the rest of us are the leftover, right? That's the feeling you walk away with. So you feel guilty, but what is that guilt supposed to translate into? What is it? And the, uh, the objective of the Quran isn't that you hear the ayat of Allah and you sit there and you kind of, you know, lament and you, you know, revel in your negative feelings and you say, okay, next week, ah, astaghfirullah, what can we do? This, this idea of helpless, this idea of maskana, the reason Allah gave us these ayat is because Allah told us that we are the next ummah to be chosen and we will be tested. So you notice in Surah Al-Baqarah, after Bani Israel were described and how they failed all of these tests, at the end of all of that, Allah said to us, Allah will test you in all kinds of ways. Allah will, put it, will be putting all of you to the test in all kinds of ways. So now, what does this translate for, for us, not just as individuals, but even as a society? First and foremost, we have to bring back the concept of what it means to be an ummah. And we keep talking about how the nations and the politicians and everybody else, but we're, this, the, 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 the concept of an ummah will not be restored from the top down, it will be restored from the bottom up. What that means is, you're here in this community, 
what sense of umma do you demonstrate in your own neighborhood? How many of the people that you, you and I come to Jawa, we make salah, we say salam, and we, we talk to the three people that we know and we go back. How are we building networks within ourselves? How are we building alliances within ourselves? How are we building connections within ourselves? How are we, we're, we're, we're becoming hyper individualistic. Everybody's just look, look thinking about their job, their family, their savings, their house payments, their this, their this, their this, and their few friends. That's it. And the only reason we come to the masjid is to fulfill a religious obligation. What sense of ummah other than artificially sitting together? We need to do something more. We need to build more brotherhood, build more sisterhood, build more alliances, do more positive things together. This is ta'awadu ala al-birri wa taqwa This creates a sense of ummah. And Allah created this machine, Salatul Jum'ah, so naturally so many of us come together. Every single week there's a convention. There's no advertising, there's no marketing campaign, nothing. We show up. We show up for this event every single week. There's a convention held by Allah. Literally a convention held by Allah. An opportunity for us to be more united than we were the week before. That's what this is. So instead, especially going out of your comfort zone, getting to know people from other than your ethnicity, other than your age group. It's not the youth should all hang out together. Young people should be getting to know the elders in a community. It's not just that, you know, what one, one ethnicity by themselves. Go talk to people who don't speak your language. Go figure out, you know. Go make, make new friends, make new connections. And this is actually absolutely, we think this is a small thing. This is absolutely essential. And when this starts happening in one masjid, another masjid, another masjid, when this starts happening in a thousand masjid, when this starts happening in a million masjid, when this starts happening around the world, can you imagine what's happening? We are tiny individual dots right now. But at least now we become bigger circles. And those circles become bigger circles. Naturally, a natural progression towards unity starts happening. But that we cannot sit there and talk about how this nation is divided and that nation is divided when we ourselves are doing nothing towards that end. So we shouldn't underestimate the smallest of the efforts that are going towards that end. And we shouldn't underestimate that our collective tawbah and our collective desire to be different we are made different. We're not like other nations. We are, we are, our, our goals are different. Our agendas are different. Our priorities are different. Our family obligations are different. We're different. And the more we bind together, the more that difference will become prominent. Otherwise, we're going to be not that different from those Israelites who, even when they come out of the colonial rule, still want to act like the colonizing nation. How many Muslim nations used to be colonized a century ago? They were living under French, British, Dutch colonization and the colonizer left, the, col the ruler left, and they want to be like the colonizer even after the colonizer left. They want to dress like the colonizer, look like the colonizer, talk like the colonizer, eat like the colonizer, hold their weddings like the colonizer. This is Isn't it? Take the best of other nations, take their, take their technology, take their advancements. We're supposed to learn from each other. There's no harm in that. But our value, when we, we start thinking the values of other nations are superior to our values, we haven't really understood what our own values. May Allah Azza wa Jal make us a real ummah once again. And may Allah Azza wa Jal empower every one of the people listening to this and every Muslim in the world to develop a sense that they have to do their part and reuniting the ummah, even if it's two people, even if it's three people, but they have to do their part. May Allah Azza wa Jal allow each of us to do our part in serving the cause of this great ummah. Barakallahu li wa lakum fi kitab al-hakim wa nafa'ali wa iyaakum bil-ayati wa dhikr al-hakim.